Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Booz. I'm a developer advocate with Timescale. And I'm excited to be part of the first CytusCon, an event for Postgres uh, this inaugural year. It's been great to see this really come to fruition. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about point-in-time query tuning in Postgres with um, PG stat statements and, and why an approach like this could be valuable as you're learning more about Postgres and how you can really dive into what's going on internally. So again, my name is Ryan Booz. You can reach me at Twitter, at Ryan Booz, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about what's going on with PG stat statements. So the agenda for today will be a, a really brief primer on PG stat statements. Um, you know, I don't want to make an assumption that anybody knows everything about PG stat statements or really what it, it provides for you. So we're going to do a quick primer. I'll show you then and talk about how we can track the information it provides historically. Give you a really brief demo. This is a, a 25 minute talk, so we don't have a lot of time for that. But I just want to show you a little bit about how it could work for you. And then we will talk briefly about a couple of other alternatives that have come around, honestly, just in the last three or four years with Postgres, something you might want to think about looking at. So let's talk briefly about PG stat statements, give you a little bit of a primer. You know, what is PG stat statements? It is an extension that's part of Postgres. It's actually included when you install Postgres as an extension. However, it's not enabled. So this is unique uh, to most of the other extensions that you'll hear about in the Postgres community. Most of them have to be installed in some way because they're developed by somebody other than the core Postgres team. This is a, a tool provided with Postgres. It's there when you install, but it's not enabled by default. And the reason it's not enabled is even though it's been around for a long time, you know, the, the, the greater community doesn't want to make that choice for you because it does require a little bit of resource to run. It's got to be looking at all the activity happening within the planning and execution engine to give you the information that it provides. And so even though it's available, uh, it, it, all you have to do is configure it with shared preload libraries. There's a lot of documentation on how to do this. It's something we're not going to get into today, just to know that it's there and it's available for you. And then what it does is it tracks the aggregated statistics for all queries in the cluster. Right, so in Postgres, a cluster is really, maybe in some other databases, we'd call it a server with multiple databases. So all of those databases together is considered a cluster. And as soon as it's enabled, it will start tracking statistics uh, for those databases. Now, for you to actually then see it, you need to install the extension within a database. And what that does is provide the view so that you can actually get that information out. So once you've enabled it, uh, and you've installed that view into at least one database, you can start to query the information and see what you can glean out of what it's providing for you. So what does it store? How does it aggregate it? It aggregates all this information by database ID. So every database in a Postgres cluster has a unique ID. The user ID that is making the query, that is connected, the connection user ID. And then the query ID, and we're going to look in a minute on exactly what's happening with that query ID and how Postgres determines unique queries to track statistics for. And then those stats are grouped by all of these, uh, you know, all of these these three keys by this internal hash of the query ID. And so when we talk about a hash, what does that mean? Well, you can imagine uh, I could type a query very similar to yours, uh, and Postgres has to determine. Are we actually querying essentially the same thing just with a different value in the where clause, or is this really a unique query in and of itself? What it does is it parameterizes that query. So it tries to identify the things that are similar and are not changing, and the variables within the query that might be swapped in and out depending on who's running the query, or maybe, you know, let's say this is a good example. I say, you know, select ID and name from a table where ID equals 1,000. What PG stat statements will store is effectively uh, what you see below with that dollar sign one standing in for that 1000. And now anytime I write a query like this or very, very similar to this, but maybe I say ID 2000, it will store the same statistics together for both of those queries because essentially they're the exact same query just with a different predicate in the query. However, uh, notice that this is text-based, right? There's a part of this, it is the actual query string. 
And so if I do the same query, but with an in clause, that becomes a unique instance within PGStat statements. This is honestly really helpful. You know, your application might be using, for instance, an ORM. And so you think you're only selecting ID and name from a table, but as you join other tables to it, or the ORM decides maybe it wants to do an in clause rather than equal or a greater or a between, those can produce wildly different statistics for a query. Maybe it's an inefficient join, uh, you know, or that ID, the, the statistics are actually out of date and the query does a lot more work than it intended, than you thought it should do. So that's how it identifies and, and provides these unique queries. And then this is the information it stores. It stores execution time at uh, total, min, max, mean, standard deviation. Uh, it does that for planning, uh, total number of calls, rows, buffers, and even some wall data, the actual number of bytes that have been uh, you know, worked with wall for each statement. Now, some of this information, remember I said at the very beginning that it's not enabled by default. And so when you do enable PGStat statements, initially, it only tracks execution time. If you want it to track some of the other information, particularly around planning, because that requires yet just a little bit more resource, you actually do have to enable that as well. Again, all that's clearly laid out in documentation. In all, PGStat statements as of Postgres 14 uh, will provide you with 31 columns of data when you query the view. Uh, and that's the, you know, that includes the query ID and the database ID and so forth. So actual statistical data, I believe if you take those out, it's about 28 columns of statistic data possible. Some of them may be zero, as you'll see in this example. So in this instance, I was using a, a server, a database that did not have planning time enabled. Uh, it just wasn't what I set up when I was running some of these examples. And so those columns will still be returned, but you won't see it in, uh, you'll just see zeros for that. The other thing to note is this, because PGStat statements is actually tracking data across the cluster, anybody, essentially anybody can query this if the view is available. There are some limitations to that. But if they are not a super user, they will not be able to see the actual query or query ID of any other database that they don't have access to. So if, if I'm not a super user, I can't see statements and actual queries across the whole cluster, but I can see some of their statistics because that might be impacting my database I'm using right now. So depending on how you're hosted and what you do within your cluster, you might see times where query ID and query are actually blank, or they might say insufficient privilege, something like that. So now that we have this information, you would think, okay, great. I have a cluster. I want to, you know, figure out what's happening with my queries when my server uh, becomes, you know, slow or something isn't acting as I expect. But there's a little bit of a problem, and this has been kind of a known, you know, like stumper for some people within the community when they first try to use PG stat statements. And that is, as I said at the beginning. All of the statistics are cumulative since the last restart of the server. Now there's an asterisk there. There are actually functions that you can reset them. So uh, some of the older um, you know, examples might say, hey, if, if you're having a problem or you really need to look at uh, statistics for a set of queries, you, know, you can actually reset the statistics, let the process run, and then you know, set it again and see what happened during that time period. It's not a really effective way of kind of digging into how a query is functioning over time. So always keep that in mind. Uh, you know, this is all cumulative. So actually, for me, I was at a conference uh, actually this last year, and it's it's been funny for me as someone who works for a time series database company on Postgres to think, well, wait a second, why don't we just store these snapshots over time? And so uh, I came back looking for an opportunity to give some demonstration on that uh, because of tools that I was used to maybe in other databases that kind of do this automatically for you. So what does that look like? Well, I do want to give you two caveats. I forgot about that for a second. Postgres 13. So depending on the version of Postgres you're using. Now, remember, this is included as part of Postgres. And so you probably have access to this, even if you are in a hosted solution like RDS, you have something similar to, uh, I think you can actually install PGStat statements there as well. Depending on the version of Postgres, you might see a couple things that are unique. Starting with Postgres 13, some of the column names are modified because uh, we split out execution and planning time. So in older versions, 12 and below, there's just a total time, for instance. Now it is total exec time and total plan time. 
And then in PG-14, some neat things were done. They actually uh, included the hashing algorithm as part of the Postgres code. We were using some external libraries before that. And so you can enable PG stat statements, but if you don't want it to be maybe uh, you know capturing information for a period of time, you can set this compute query ID to false, and it just won't collect uh, data for that period of time. That is, uh, you know, a way to kind of switch it on and off while still leaving it enabled and ready to go. Uh, and because it's part of the pre uh, shared preload libraries, that requires restarts. Where in this case, you can reload the conf and it will start doing it right away. Uh, and then there was a, a new informational view. One of the other things that was hard to determine before Postgres 14, without some hackery, was when was the last time these statistics were reset? And, and really your best guess was at server restart time. Now we provide a view that actually will allow you to see the last time the statistics were reset. So let's talk about how this actually functions uh, as, a, as a theory for how you might be able to use this information in something like Postgres to go ahead and track the value of, of what the statistics are giving you. It's really a three-step process. We need to create some set of tables to store this data. Now I'm gonna show you one way of doing it that I've been using, uh, and actually we've been using here at Timescale for some of the stuff that we do. Your situation might, uh, you might have a different way you wanna store this information, but you can take this as a principle. So we create the tables to store the information we want, uh, we can join other tables like uh, you know PG roles and database if we want to get names of databases, things like that. Um, I, I put this on here. It is actually helpful uh, if you have the ability to do so to actually store this in a separate database. And the reason is this. You know, again, PG stat statements is tracking statistics for all the databases in the cluster. Well, your statistics database, where we're about to store this information, is actually uh, you know, going to show up in those queries as well. So if you want to be able to filter them out easily, putting it in a separate database where you can filter on database, database ID or name, just be really helpful. And then finally, um, you know, partitioning is really highly recommended if this is something you want to explore and, and use more long term. There's a lot of data that you're going to be storing, uh, you know, thousands of rows per maybe per minute or per five minutes. Over time, it's helpful to drop that information. There are databases like TimescaleDB that will make that really easy. Uh, I know Citus has opportunities for that as well. And then depending on the, the database that you're using, so TimescaleDB is an extension. You can even get compression, which will allow you to store that information for longer, uh, data retention, things like that. So it's really helpful if this proves to be a valuable method for you, look at ways of doing partitioning, either directly in, in Postgres with native uh, declarative partitioning or something like Timescale or Citus. Uh, once you have the data, you have the tables, we, we need to actually store the information. So we need to create some automated process for querying uh, PG stat statements, storing the information it provides, all of those cumulative values for that timestamp in the database. Uh, again, the Nice thing here is you really could do many things depending on what you need. You could customize the, the procedure or the query that's happening maybe per database. Some databases are essential and maybe you want that to be queried once a minute so you have a finer grain view of what was going on. Other databases might not be. Maybe you only want to store statistics every 10 minutes just so you have an idea if something went wrong. And so you can kind of clarify and do that on your own uh, depending on how you want to write these queries. And then you need to find a way to do that. There are at least three ways. I know there are more. These are three that I know of. Uh, obviously, Timescale DB, we provide access to our engine when you have Timescale installed. You simply create a store procedure, set up a user-defined action, and then it will run on a time basis. PG Cron has been around for a long time, actually created long ago by folks uh, with Citus data. Uh, you know, it's used uh, in a lot of places, very possible to use PG Cron as well. And then there's uh, another one, PG Timetable, I haven't used before, I know it exists, and, and some people find great value in using that as well. Find something, some way that you can create a procedure, run these queries to store the data. And then the fun part happens. Up until I started thinking about doing this, uh, without using an external tool, I really never thought about hooking up something like Grafana to actually watch the performance of my queries in a database over time. So this is an example of a dashboard we use internally for some of our business processes. Uh, and you know we can watch the databases almost in real time, right? So as this thing runs every minute or every five minutes, we see these statistics updated simply by querying PG stat statements. 
What I'd like to do now is show you a demo of how you could do this. Now, the queries I'm providing for you, I will make available uh, both through Twitter and, and through the uh, CytusCon uh, website, it, the Discord channel that they're providing. We'll make sure you have access to it. It's really just a starting place for you to think about how you could approach this given the kind of information that you might want for your cluster. So I'm going to uh, flip over to uh, dBeaver. It's the tool I use when I get demos, mostly because I can put comments in here for when I share the scripts. Uh, you know, it just I can kind of follow the script in total. Doing it in a terminal with psql can be hard for others to follow. So at a high level, we're going to do three things here. First, uh, I because I'm doing this in the same database as the application I'm monitoring, uh, I'm creating a separate schema. We then create two different kinds of tables. This is how I chose to do it for this situation. You could go further, you could do less. One is a snapshots table. So rather than just storing the information per query, per, um, you know, per query, per database, per user, if I wanted to just kind of get a high level view of the whole query, particularly if I had many databases, I would have to sum all of that information up, aggregate it every time I wanted like that high level view. If I do that at creation time, I can store one row per snapshot and then store the detailed information separately if I want to dig in further. And so this is a snapshot table that stores essentially all of the same information we talked about earlier, those 31 columns of data with a timestamp and some other things thrown in. We can then uh, separately create a table to store the queries themselves. So every time I run pgstat statements, I actually get the query text that it is storing. Those can get really big. If I'm storing that query text over and over and over again, I know it's not changing because the hash ID is the same. So if I can store that separately, I'm going to save space. I'm going to make this just a more manageable way to query my data. And so we're going to do that as part of our query. And then finally, we are going to essentially create now the statement by statement uh, table to store every time we take a snapshot, the statistics for each query, for each user, and for each database. And so this looks very, very similar to that high level snapshot table, but now this is actually storing the statement by statement version of that data. Once we create all that information, we need to create that procedure or that however you're going to execute this information, this, this statement to store the information. And in this example, we did it as a multi-part CTE, so a common table expression. And with that expression, we start by doing a statement view. So we actually just get the statements out of pgstat statements. And then uh, we take that, that gets us our actual table of data. Notice I'm joining in PG roles and PG database. So I can just a little bit more information about names in there. It makes it easier to query and see. We then take the queries out. So we take that first set of data, which is pgstat statements data. Now we're just getting the queries out of there to store them separately with a query ID. And then we're going to take uh, the information in total and store the snapshot, that high-level cluster-wide snapshot. That's this next statement. We're simply doing a sum on all of the data without regard to user, database, or query. We're just saying, give me everything for this cluster at this moment in time, and then we can track that at a high level. And then finally, uh, we actually then take the full PGSAT statements, taking out the query text, and storing the individual values for the snapshot for every database and uh, query and user ID at that snapshot time. So this can be thousands of rows, depending on how active your server is. And again, when you go look at the configuration of pgstat statements, you can uh, actually change how many statements it will store over time and when it kicks things out and things like that. Uh, by default, it's 5,000 queries. So if you have a really active cluster, uh, you know the very least used queries will typically not be stored in there very long. Uh, you'll just have to see how that works for you. Once we have that in place, we just have to figure out how to actually trigger this uh, data. So I'm using TimescaleDB because it's what I know best. Again, regardless of whether you use TimescaleDB, PGCron, or something of that nature, you have to trigger this procedure. Uh, I'm going to go by this right now. This is actually uh, ways that we can set up uh, the hyper tables in Postgres. We can set up automatic compression, data retention, things like that. At the very end, then, I simply set up a job. And we say, hey, every minute, go ahead and execute this procedure. And that's going to go ahead and store our data. Once we do that, we can come down and do a couple of things. So first, 
we basically are doing a windowed query row by row over the data. So this simply says, for every row of data, subtract the values from the previous row, and that gets us the delta, the amount of, you know, the, the change in calls and execution time and so forth between those two values. And if I know the time span between the rows, I can get an idea of how many, for instance, calls per minute happened over that time. So when I run a query like this, uh, this application is running right now. Again, it's not a very active application. You'll notice again, plan time is not uh, showing because we're not tracking planning in this instance. But we get a sense for how many calls per minute are happening for each of these queries. You'll see that it's happening minute by minute. I didn't aggregate anything. I haven't done any kind of bucketing or date trunk. So this is the actual time stamp so that it was called as the process happened. Now, once I kind of know this, this is at the high level server level, this is that snapshot. Maybe I want to dig into a specific query and I can do that with essentially the same information, but now I can do it uh, identifying, you know, I could say, hey, let's do this for a specific query ID that might be there. And now I can say, not just what happened for the whole server, I saw a spike here. It looks like this query maybe caused some of that spike. What was it? What was going on there? Was it the number of rows, number of calls? What was happening to that query? So I can identify very similar information, but now just for that query, how many times it was called, execution time, so forth. So once you have those deltas, what can this look like in a application? So I just want to show you really briefly. This is a dashboard that's actually attached to this it, live happening right now. What this application does, it's a sample application that uh, kind of mimics a truck fleet. It tracks time and it tracks location and a couple other things, fuel consumption, what have you. It's all fake data. But you'll notice I've I'm tracking 10,000 trucks. And you might notice that uh, I have about 10,000 rows per minute being inserted into this database. Nothing else is going on with the database right now. There have been a couple times where I've queried some information. Uh, I stopped it for one a brief moment before I uh, began recording this demo. So I can kind of see what's happening. And then down below, I can actually take that information and aggregate the individual queries order them by things that are most important to me. So maybe in this case, I want to see queries that are not effective at their cache uh, utilization. So they aren't using cache data. They're often going off to have to read information from disk, which is not an efficient way of doing a query. And so once I say, ah, this looks like a problem query, I can now go to the statements database, open up a unique uh, view, and I can now see out of that aggregated delta data, individual information about the view, uh, the statement, including the actual statement that was being run. So using PGSTAT statements to actually get point in time query tuning is not that difficult once you understand the concepts of how to store it and how to query it. So hopefully that has been a helpful, uh, a helpful way to see that just because it's cumulative, it doesn't mean that it's something you can't utilize for your actual query tuning. Your, your server tuning, really probably more than anything else to identify when something happened. I want to briefly just tell you about two alternatives that have come on the market in the last few years. Again, the cumulative nature of PGStat statements is something many people have recognized. And so PGStat Monitor is a uh, tool written by Procona. It's an open source extension that does much of the same uh, kind of practice behind the scenes. It also stores query plans, uh, table access data. Uh, it will actually, you can configure it to query uh, to store the actual values that were part of the queries. Sometimes the same query with one value can really go kind of off the rails. You need to figure out why that is. Maybe statistics are out of date. Uh, this is not quite a 1.0. I've not actually used it, but I've been uh, I've watched two different demos of it, and it, it has some really great features. It's definitely worth checking out if you have the ability to install it. Again, one of the values of PG stat statements is it's essentially there and ready for you to use all the time. And then PG Analyze. Uh, it's a great tool uh, by, by a company that will actually take PG stat statements, send the information to their servers, uh, and do a lot of what I just showed you, but more automatically. So check those out. If you know maybe you get started with this kind of solution for yourself, storing the data, querying it, and then if you want a little bit more information, maybe you go to the next level with something like this. I hope that's just been a helpful, quick uh, intro to PG stat statements and seeing that you really can get a lot more value out of it than just that cumulative data that you're used to seeing. Really appreciate you uh, tuning into this session. If you have any uh, anything you'd like to ask me about or maybe some things I missed and ways we could make this better, please reach out to me. Uh, my my 
uh, Twitter handles down below at Ryan Booz. And really, I just love to know what questions you have, how we can make this better, and maybe ways we can use this in a new way. Thank you so much for your time today.